Hello there, my name is Noble Absinthe, and I review obscure Mega 10 stuff, so you don't have to. Today, we're talking about Persona Trinity Soul, the long-awaited sequel to Persona 3. There's no 4 or 3.5, who was responsible for this? I mean, poor marketing and branding aside, it's about Persona, which means it's gotta be good, right? It was released in 2008, which is a year after Persona 3's release. So, at the time, this titling made sense, and hey, Trinity means three, so Trinity, Persona 3, I'm willing to give it a pass. But real talk, I didn't know this series existed until very recently, and I'm a longtime fan of Atlas. It was a complete accident that I found this anime. Two weeks ago, seriously, if you put a gun to my head and asked me if this was a Mega 10 property, I'd be dead right now, instead of summoning whatever budget Persona these Randys are using. And, okay, maybe calling these characters Randys is a little mean, but Atlas is meaner. They haven't shown this IP any kinds of love. You see this image right here? This is promotional art for Persona 4, featuring the protagonist from Persona 3 Portable, and of course Persona 4. This character here? That's the main character of Trinity Soul. His name is Shin. I always thought, for whatever reason, that this was an early concept art for Yosuke. Like, it takes place in the Velvet Room, so I thought there was like a filter overlay that made his hair brown instead of orange, like a like a blue lens filter for a camera, right? But no, this is a completely new character, this is a completely different series, this is Shin, and he's the protagonist of Trinity Soul. And before you ask, he's non-canon. Maybe at one point he was, but not anymore. You see, with Persona's 25th anniversary just passing, Atlas has shown that they don't want to give him any kind of attention, his series or him or otherwise. He's missing in all of the promotional material, he didn't get a plushie made of him, and he isn't even drawn for the Velvet Room gathering photo. Poor guy, even in his own anime, he doesn't get his own Velvet Room. Igor just says hi and then leaves. So with that and his treatment, you would think Shin and by extension Trinity Soul were awful, but no. The anime is actually perfectly serviceable. So let's get into it. Persona Trinity Soul takes place 10 years after the events of Persona 3. However, we are in Ayanagi City now, instead of Iwatodai. The story revolves around three brothers, Ryo, the eldest, Shin, the middle child, and Jun being the youngest. The Trinity part is in reference to the three brothers. It's not very deep, just roll with it. With such an emphasis on brotherhood though, you would expect this anime to focus on the importance of family. And it does. The show really likes to hammer home that no matter what, family comes first. So even when you bicker or get the cold shoulder, deep down, you still love each other. The show also hits all the right notes of what can be considered modern persona. We have a main character who is sent to a new place for one year. He'll make new friends, forge unbreakable bonds, and deal with and be a witness to various physical and emotional hardships that conveniently tug at the audience's heartstrings due to empathy. And then, finally, our heroes will fight an otherworldly big bad villain to save all of humanity. It's a tried and true formula, and what makes it timeless is all the minor details you can change to give a fresh take on it. The Persona formula is a lot like curry, LeBlanc's curry. They all have the same basic premise and ingredients, but the differences are in the little small touches, the little spices you can put into it. So, for example, this time around, instead of just one main character being transferred to a new place, we have two, and they're brothers, Shin and Jun, and they're gonna live with their older brother Ryo in the house they all grew up in. So, as each episode passes, we get to know more about their family history, and how they're forced by a cruel twist of fate to fix their late parents' mistakes. Usually in anime, it's always the parents' fault. Before we dive into the story, let's go over the visuals and audio. This anime looks really nice. It's modern anime, so everything has a clean cut to it. I'm sorry for the compression and artifacts, but this was the highest quality video I could get my hands on from questionable means, and it was from the DVD rip that is only 1280 by 720 resolution. There was no definitive Blu-ray edition for a higher resolution, and I don't expect there to ever be one, and this isn't even on Crunchyroll, which is really sad. It, it seems like Atlas made this poor series, scrapped it, and left it to fester right there with Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei. The animation 
is serviceable. There isn't a lot of dynamic movement for most of the episodes, as it's a very conversational anime. That's code for we have no budget. So it aims, or it hopes to aim for, tension building through dialogue and to eventually pay it off during the action sequences. And when those action scenes come, well, they last for about two minutes. The fights are fine for the most part, they're flashy and every hit has some really good impact, but I would have preferred seeing the whole model for the Persona. For some reason, the Personas have their opacity lowered to 50%, so you can't get a good look of what's happening or even what they look like, and they use tweening to save on budget. But the important frames, and the money shot scenes, well they look really good. As for the art quality, it's almost always on model. I did notice at some point, some characters' eyes being larger in some scenes, but that's mostly nitpicking. And for those who care, there is CG in this anime. But it's limited to vehicles and other types of machinery, which is where CG is most effective. So in general, for the art, I like it. It's clean, professional, and if you snipped a few scenes here and there and called it a deleted scene from Persona 5, I'm sure you trick some people. I don't get to watch new anime often, or newish anime, so I'm lenient with the art. You see, I'm trapped in a YouTube cycle of watching other people review stuff I've already watched, mostly for the sole purpose of violating my nostalgia through contrarian opinions. We've all been there, right? So I don't do that thing where I find a still image of an anime and call the entire thing crap. Trinity Soul looks really nice, and its art quality is consistent. I can't ask for more. Anyway, before I get to that story, did you know that less than 10% of the people who watch my videos are subscribed? It doesn't cost you anything, and it will mean the world to me if you subscribed. It really motivates me to make more Mega 10 content. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna make them regardless, but you see, I'm always looking to improve, and that little subscribe, that goes a long way. And I always take fan suggestions and recommendations. I take them very seriously. So please, follow the growth of this channel. Thank you. So, about that story. Well, it starts with our protagonists, Shin and Jun Kanzato. They've made it to their old house where their older brother Ryo is staying, but he's not home from work yet. Ryo is a 28-year-old police chief in the Ayanagi Police Department. He's focusing on the recent findings of people being left without their skin. This is due to an increase in persona extractions, which, as the name implies, robs a person of their mask for everyday life. It's a brutal and violent way to die. Ryo knows who is responsible for these crimes, a neurosurgeon by the name of Kisuke Komotsubara. He is the leader of a terrorist organization called the Merbito. He did persona focus experiments 10 years ago, specifically on his underage daughter Ayane. Her hatred, yet begrudging loyalty to her father, is what caused the tragedy that befell Ayanagi City 10 years ago. It was a horrible shockwave that caused many people to lose their lives. Ryo and Shin were witnesses to it, with Shin having his mind wiped to forget the trauma. So, in regards to our main cast, it cost the lives of our hero's parents and Jun's twin sister Yuki. Ryo uses this incident as motivation to catch Kisuke, but now that Shin and Jun move back in, he has to be concerned about their well-being. He wants them to leave the city, but his cold attitude encourages them to figure out what he's hiding. I find Ryo's motivations and actions to be believable. However, as the series progresses, and as our cast obtain their personas, he, for some reason, doesn't see the advantage of having his brothers around. His secrecy actually becomes counterproductive, as the people close to him try to figure out the truth. And in the end, there's dire consequences. His persona is known as Cain, and yes, it's a direct reference to that Cain from the Bible. And to fall in line with the idea of Christian lore, Shin has Abel, and June has Seth. If you come from a religious background, I'm sorry to say you won't get much mileage out of knowing their backstories, but it's interesting nonetheless. Cain was the older brother of Abel and Seth. The story goes that Abel was a shepherd that offered God a lamb from his herd, whereas Cain offered a sheaf of wheat. God preferred Abel for his greater sacrifice. In response to this, Cain killed Abel out of a jealous rage. This was the first murder in all of mankind, and the punishment God bestowed Cain was that all of his descendants will be cursed. Seth, the brother that no one talks about, was simply the replacement for Abel, and all of his children 
were blessed. This is how people back in the day rationalized good and bad luck. In the anime, Ryo does have a confrontation with Shin, but it doesn't end with Shin dying. Instead, Ryo dies because of his self-sacrifice. His persona has an ultimate ability that requires an exchange of life to even use. I guess you could say he was cursed from the start. Each of their personas have a unique power, just like in the video games. Ryo has long-range damage, Shin can seal personas into his sword without killing the host, and Jun has the ability to calm personas and act as a sensory type like Fuka, Risei, or Futaba. If you're wondering why I'm covering these personas and really dancing around the end of the story, it's because not much happens during the majority of this anime. This is one of those animes where you watch each episode expecting a payoff, but it's just one continuous cliffhanger. There are some standout episodes that are self-contained stories, which I like the most, and there's some good moments for the main story, but it won't click together until a second viewing. So on your second viewing, you can now follow the story more closely and understand the mechanics of this world. Because Persona Trinity Soul has a lot of lore to personas and their mechanics, and it kind of gets in the way of the main story because there's so much information you need to juggle. Also, this lore, it gets quickly swept under the rug by Persona 4, the real sequel. You see, the story explains that as you get older, it becomes more and more difficult to keep your persona. In fact, the people in the know have made experimental drugs to keep personas in a docile state. These pills are the reason Ryo can use his persona at age 28. Without them, well, the persona will go wild on a killing spree, taking out any innocent bystanders and sometimes even the user themselves. Older persona users are then dependent on these drugs just to survive. The personas in this series are different than the ones we see in the mainline games. You don't need to rip off a mask, break a tarot card, confront your shadow, or shoot yourself in the head. You simply just summon it. Summon it in all of its 50% opacity glory. Also, none of these characters are assigned an arcana, and Shin isn't even a wild card. The idea of losing your personas as you get older is a nice idea. It means you either conform to society or you grow into your real self. I'm not going to get quasi-philosophical with personas in this video, because we'd be here all day. And also, Persona 4 retcons all of this, this entire anime with just one character, Toru Adachi. This guy was in his late 20s, like Ryo, and he still had a persona. He never had to take drugs to keep it active. So, yeah, who would have guessed Persona 4 would be the real sequel to Persona 3, and not whatever this is. But joking aside, I like it when a series adds new things to the lore. In the mainline games, Personas are really treated like Pokemon or stands, and only shine when a character has their big moment. You never question how these ethereal beings work in the real world. So, I thought of it as innovative to really dive into how personas affect the user. You see, there's two types of persona users, Class A and Class B. Like the story of Cain and Abel, you're either blessed or cursed. Class A users don't suffer any kind of side effects of having a persona. And conveniently, that's our main cast, except Ryo. Sorry, pal. If you're Class B, you're the bad guys because you need to have drugs to survive. Which, when I say it like that, it sounds really sad. The Merbito must be written as empathetic villains, right? Well, no. The anime does that thing where the bad guys are comically evil until at the last second where they give us their excuse, which is meant to absolve them of all their crimes. Except it doesn't. You guys killed a lot of innocent people, and they rightfully die in horribly painful and karmic ways. So let's talk about Shin's classmates. They're the good guys. This is our supporting cast. We don't have a huge cast of characters, but we have enough to fill a four-man party. We have Megumi Kayano, Takuro Sakakiba, and Kanaru Morimoto. With the series only being 26 episodes long, having a smaller cast works to the series' benefit. Megumi is the high-energy extrovert. She's into street dancing and is the school buzzkill on the phenomenon known as shadow extraction which I'll go over later when talking about Kanaru Morimoto because it's a whole thing on its own. Megumi had a tragic childhood, which is very common for Persona characters. She and her family were in a car accident. 
her persona activated and was able to save her parents and herself. But before she could fully shield the car, her little brother was flung outside the window and died when he hit the pavement. She hates herself and her persona for not being able to protect him. And, to cement her self-hatred, her mother tells her that she loved the younger brother more and wished Megumi was the one to die. That's not something any mother should wish on their child. The only saving grace for this mother character was that she didn't see Megumi's persona save everyone because she was conveniently unconscious. There's an entire episode dedicated to Megumi and her mother making amends, and the mother realizing that she owes her entire life to her daughter. This is one of the best episodes in the series, and it's a solid reason to just watch the anime in general. It's a self-contained episode revolving around one character, and it feels like a social link. Except, the caveat is Shin, our protagonist, he has no input, because he's almost always sleeping. If you're expecting this anime to be a good mirror to the mainline Persona games, it's not. And that's okay, it's just different. So, for example, Shin has a personality in the series. It's not much, but he's not just stoic nice guy like the other protagonist. He can be argumentative, crafty, abrasive, and before this series began, he was a talented artist. He also sleeps a lot, did I mention that? So, he's got some substance behind him. However, unlike the mainline protagonists, he doesn't influence others to change. They come to their own conclusions. He's just not a driving factor in anyone's growth, which is completely alien to me. There's no moment where his friends say things like, I owe so much to you, or I'm grateful for knowing you. There's not even a big send-off in the final episode. I don't know if that's good or bad, it's just different. Anyway, Megumi's persona is the Roman goddess Diana, a master archer and huntress. Diana was also the goddess of modesty for young girls. This is reflective in her persona as she wields a bow, if you could see it. And Megumi is the most conservative of the group, denouncing drugs, lewd acts, and shadows and personas in general. Next, we have Takuro Sakakiba. He's a mix of Ryuji and Yosuke. He's the comic relief best friend who's rough around the edges. He doesn't really do anything funny aside from getting injured, but you get that Yosuke Ryuji vibe. And like them, he knows the main cast and acts as a way to get our character up to speed about the school. When he first gets access to his persona, he can't control it. In fact, it takes literally the entire series for him to finally not be sent flying. After a while, it's not funny anymore, guys. By the way, in this universe, personas can make you fly, so that's neat. Takuro's whole backstory is that his father went missing when he was a kid, a byproduct of the shockwave event 10 years ago. He misconstrued it as his father finding another woman, but that wasn't the case. He eventually gets reunited with his father, just not in the way you'd think. The shockwave caused a Freaky Friday event to occur, where the mind of his father was swapped with this random woman. This woman mentions things only his father would know, things pertaining to Power Rangers, and Takuro accepts this woman as his father. He then unloads his feelings of contempt and also explains how he's made some really great friends. It's good closure for the character, and then the woman vanishes away into the ether. Takuro is a perfectly fine character, like Megumi. He just has the one episode to shine, and it's about issues with their parents. Takuro's persona is Spartacus. Like Megumi, it is a Roman-inspired persona, which is more in line with the majority of the cast from Persona 3. Spartacus was a slave and gladiator. He was the symbol of freedom and rebellion against oppression. And he led a slave uprising against the Republic, which would later be known as the Third Servile War, of which he died in battle. None of these traits of being a leader against oppression are shown through his persona or Takuro himself. Also, his persona is just this big thing. He also doesn't die in combat, and he never felt like a slave to anyone. Honestly, Spartacus would have been better used in Persona 5 Royal with his theme of rebellion. Lastly, we have Kanaru Morimoto. This character is our Aegis stand-in. She's a robot girl and the love interest of our main character. How familiar. She's meant to act as the blue oni to Megumi. She's the reserved introvert of the group, most of the time. Her original goal from her programming 
was to spread the rumor of shadow extraction to find Persona users. But something happened to make her forget. Now, I've been mentioning this phrase, shadow extraction, a lot, so I might as well explain it with this character, because Kanaru Morimoto is addicted to shadow extraction. To elaborate, shadow extraction is similar to persona extraction, just without the death and the skinlessness. Essentially, you pat someone on the head, or grab their shoulders, or do anything. It's never fully explained. The idea is that it's meant to leak out a bit of a person's shadow, otherwise known as their unrefined or unmastered persona. This, in turn, causes a sense of euphoria, for whatever reason. I'm not going to be grasping at straws here as to why this makes a person high. It just does. Maybe there's a technical reason or a deep symbolic one. If you want to explain why leaking your shadow causes euphoria, please post your thoughts below. In regards to the anime, shadow extraction acts as a PSA against unsafe drug use, and then, later on, for unsafe sex with multiple partners. And the anime makes this very explicit. You feel like you're getting hit over the head with an anvil on its not-so-subtle subliminal messaging. But because I'm bound by YouTube law to explain and show everything, here you go. The anime has this thing about making shadow and persona extraction look very sexual. You'd have to be blind not to see the rape imagery or the gangbang imagery I'm showing you here. So the lesson is simple. Don't be so open about sex, you might get raped. Also, don't overdo drugs because you'll become addicted and dependent. Those are good lessons. I, I can't imagine anyone in the modern day having problems with those. Now listen, I'm all for symbolism, and I'm all for good morals, but this type of writing is just too on the nose for me. You might as well have every character get on stage and tell the audience, drugs are bad, and they did. They totally did. They have an entire episode that is a PSA against drunk driving. Don't drink and drive, you'll kill people. Oh, and like I said before, shadow extraction goes from being compared to drugs to unsafe sex, to now drunk driving. It's whatever the agenda is for that episode. But in regards to the sex thing, it's doubly annoying when characters are blind to what they're saying. This series has a lot, and I mean a lot, of double entendres. And they all come from Kanaru Morimoto. Instead of asking for Shin to do a shadow extraction on her, which is, again, tapping her on the head, she says lines like, Do me. Give it to me and don't come in, come, uh, come on, seriously, don't come inside? The anime has made it clear to make her the oblivious one, and to put her into all of the sexual scenes. Here's a gratuitous shot of her ass, don't say I never gave you anything. She's not a bad character, in fact, I like these type of characters a lot. I like reserved and sophisticated female characters. But you can't shake the feeling the writers just wanted to use her as an object. And wank to her. She never gets to fully evolve as a character, and by the time our cast find out she's a robot, she's dead. She dies peacefully, falling asleep on Shin's shoulder. Isn't this giving you Persona 3 flashbacks with Minato and Igis yet? It should. As for her persona, well, Kanaru had almost two personas. It was the same persona, but in different forms, and with two different names. The first is Astarte, the pure form and the other is Ashtoreth, the corrupt form. Both words translate from Abrahamic and Egyptian mythology to goddess. Get it? Shin Megami Tensei, Megami, goddess. This is an important persona. So important, it appears in Persona 5. Hey, look at that. They made it look worse. The persona takes two forms, one as a cute ball, this is Astarte, and the other into this tortured BDSM fetish thing. This is Ashtoreth. Again, I had to look up the art for these things because the anime makes it really hard to distinguish what I'm looking at. Her Astarte persona is a lot like June's, as it can calm others. The mythos around Astarte is interesting. She was the goddess of everything. War, hunting, love, sex, beauty, horses, and the sun. When her mythos was adopted into the Bible, it was intentionally misspelled to Ashtoreth, to mean abomination. Why? I don't know, I'm not a scholar, and Christians don't even use spell check. 
I mean, they spelled God's name wrong as Jehovah, from Yahovah, which means Yahweh. But going back to Kanaru, the idea of a persona with two faces works for this character. She was a robot that lived as a human. She had an evil past and a pure present self. She was controlled by a terrorist group, so her persona was corrupted into Ash Tareth, and went around her friends, it became pure, Astarte. It's the most fitting persona to give her. Oh, I should probably mention, there's these kids that work for the main villain Kisuke. This is the Merbito. They're discount Strega from Persona 3. The characters are so uninteresting and forgettable that this poor sap gets disintegrated by Ryo just to prove my point. I have no idea what his name was, I don't care to look it up, as he didn't matter to the plot. The only ones of interest are Sotaro Seno and Saki Tachibana, the former being a rival to Shin, but gets disintegrated by Ayane before he could have his third fight with our protagonist, and the latter being a character who changes her hairstyle to fit into the group. Saki goes from frizzy hair to long flowing locks, and no one is able to make the connection that the green-haired chick is with the bad guys. She eventually becomes a good person, just in time for her to lose all of her skin and die horribly to Ayane. I should probably talk about Ayane more because she is the final boss, and it's a bit confusing. There's, there's technically two of them. There's Phantom Ayane, which is the original. She likes to change from being a teenager to a little girl to mess with the audience. There really is no other explanation as to why she changes her age. Kisuke focused his efforts in bringing her back to life through cloning, so he's essentially Shao Tucker from Full Metal Alchemist. I mean, if she wanted to come back to life, she could have just talked to Kisuke, but Ayane just floats around being weird. And then there's Clone Ayane, who is a toned down version of the chick from Elfin Lead. She's got a decent kill count though, mostly team killing. Again, Kisuke was an unethical scientist who toyed with his own daughter and has regrets. So, to make up for his regrets, he decided to use children again, and those children were the Merbito. Their job was to find Persona users that can act as a bridge to get Ayane's soul back into a clone. That Persona user was June because plot. Turns out clones have their own soul and can occupy many souls since when Kisuke gets defeated, he hides within the clone. This got really confusing, to be honest. So the original Phantom Ayane doesn't really care about anything in the plot, and she just wants everyone dead. And throughout the series, she's the most annoying, passive-aggressive character ever. She's almighty and powerful, but she doesn't do anything. Since she can be everywhere and nowhere at the same time, she doesn't just tell people what she wants, not even her own father. Also, since her name isn't mentioned until way later, like episode 15, you're confused on what this lady in red even is. But she is dangerous. She has the ability to mess with your head. She can put you to sleep, make you experience paradise or hell, and really, whatever the plot asks for. And when she's done, she leaves these things called whale feathers, which is meant to be a reference to Shin's parents. You see, they were originally researchers of Persona, and then they turned into famous children book authors. Their hit book revolved around whale feathers and finding happiness. The characters in Trinity Soul never read the whale's feather in its entirety, so you're always getting annoyed when every character talks about the story as if you're caught up to speed. The whale's feather is such an important part of the story that they should have just read the entire thing at the credits or the opening scene of the anime so people know the context. Now honestly, I don't think you guys care about the rationale, and all these little details, and to be honest, at the time I was fading in and out of all this exposition. Like it's kinda confusing and none of it really matters, because there's this giant fight against Ayane, and it's good. Just watch the anime. It ends how you would expect, a big climactic fight with laser beams. This ends with Ryo giving up his life to fire his ultimate attack allowing Shin to go in for the kill. A bunch of people die, Shin is moving out of his house to go to college, and the story ends. The anime as a whole was just fine. I didn't have a bad time watching it, but I didn't want to give a play-by-play -play recap of every episode either. It's what I would consider a 6 out of 10 anime. It's 
okay, but it's not worth the effort of dissecting every single part of. I don't think this was a good sequel to Persona 3. It's more like a companion piece, a DLC side story if that makes any sense. I mean, I didn't even go over all the callbacks to Persona 3 now that I think about it. There's some music from the game that plays when they fight and do karaoke, and also there's Akihiko Sonata. Why didn't I make a big deal of Akihiko being a character in this anime? Well, to be honest, I forgot. But you can't blame me. He doesn't do much. He's in like 10 of the 26 episodes after the halfway point. But he's useless. He doesn't have his persona, and he's just there. He doesn't reference C's. He doesn't mentor the new kids on their personas. He's just there. They have one comedic scene where he breaks into Shin's house to eat his food and complain about expired water. Water doesn't expire, you jackass. They don't even have him make a protein joke. What is this? Like, Akihiko is a fan favorite character, and you don't have him do anything. He doesn't even throw a punch. He gets punched. I'm not asking for him to save the day, but he does nothing. He comes in to replace Ryo for a bit, and then he's like, well, the new Persona users will save the day. I'll just watch everything on my laptop. He does feel bad that he doesn't have a Persona, but that's about it. Why is he here again? I can't even compare this phenomenon to anything, where you have a character from the original better IP make a guest appearance, and then do nothing of value. Like, in Digimon, yeah, we had a new cast of characters for the new generation, and they had the spotlight, but we still had the old guard just hanging around and being mentors. It's also more upsetting when it's Akihiko of all people. This person has experienced loss multiple times. Like Shin, Akihiko lost his sister and brother and knows what it feels like to be powerless. But does he ever mention these things to Shin? Of course not. It's like the writers just picked a character at random from Persona 3, and they happened to pick the best one, and then just made him into a quest giver. Like, what is this? So, Akihiko does nothing. You're probably watching this and going, he probably missed an action scene. There's no way Akihiko just sits back and does nothing. Nope, watch it for yourself. He sits there and does nothing. So, aside from that, I think if you're a fan of Persona, you'll get an experience watching this anime. It's not a train wreck, and it's not a hidden masterpiece. It's a serviceable anime, with good art quality, and a story that's interesting, maybe a bit confused. Maybe you'll get some mileage with some headcanon from all the lore expansion with Personas, and maybe you'll have fun trying to catch all these Persona 3 references. But, like Atlas, you're free to ignore this piece of media altogether. To make something clear though, you don't have to be a fan of Persona to watch this anime, but it's definitely an anime where you go, I want to see the references to the video game I played. So, I'm giving Persona, Trinity Soul, a 6 out of 10. It's okay. Well, with that being said, thank you all so much for watching. Please, do all the things YouTubers ask for. Like, subscribe, comment, I, I read them all. But most importantly, share this video around. The YouTube algorithm really cares about virality like it always has. So share to your Discord, Twitter, Reddit, wherever. It will really help me out. I also opened a coffee page for any of you guys who want to donate to support the channel. If you donate just one time, you'll be in the credits for every video going forward for life. So, with that being said, have a good day.